Hey there. Welcome to Creation Station Monthly. I'm Bob from Creation Station. This is the monthly show where we talk to two creative people about how they got into this way of being creative and building and growing and doing. And today we have a fun one. It's called cosplay. Now, I know you're thinking, Bob, what are you doing? It, it's Halloween. Everybody dresses up and we're just done. No, I think we're going to get a little bit deeper than just dressing up for the night here. Um, it's, we've got two good guests with us. Uh, Brandon, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Brandon Hall. I actually work at now Nova Southeastern University as a circulation manager. Um, but I also, in my time off, am a performer and a cosplayer. <laughs> That's awesome. And Andrew, tell us about yourself. I'm Andrew Liptek. I am out of Vermont. I work for the Vermont Historical Society in Montpelier, and um, I'm the author of Cosplay a History. And I've also, um, I, uh, I, was a, I was a journalist, and um, I'm also a cosplayer. I, I dress up primarily as uh, characters from Star Wars. Awesome, awesome. So to, to get started, tell us about, and we'll go with you first, Andrew. How did you first get into it? I mean, Star Wars seems like a pretty easy way in, maybe, or maybe not, depending upon how complicated. I've seen some of the stuff on your website, and it looks like you got some pretty intense costumes there. Or am I using the wrong terminology? Is it costume? Is it what? Tell me. I've never really been, I've never been up on the, the calling a costume a cosplay. I always think of cosplay as the activity itself. Um, but I, yeah, Star Wars is an excellent gateway drug for <laughs> all sorts of things for nerds. Um, especially when you're 12 years old. Um, I saw the special editions when I was 12, um, 1997, and um, I was hooked. My my dad says, like, my dad took me and he says that I didn't blink the entire time, um, you know, from the, the moment the Star Destroyer started going across the stream, uh, screen. And I'm, that's, a, you know, a pretty familiar origin story for most folks, I think. And um, I got into cosplay because I was... I was a, I, I fell into it head first. I, I read the books. I went to message forums and, um, and my senior year at high school, my, I was in band. We played a suite from star Wars and, um, I'd been bugging my music teacher for six years to play it from middle school to, to senior year. And he finally got sick of me asking. So, uh, we wore him down and, uh, just to make the, the you know, night a little bit more special, we were like, all right, well, how do we, how do we make this cooler? Um, there is, you know, I knew I had known of a group called the 501st Legion, which I'm now a member of. Uh, and um, so we, we reached out to them and said, like, you know, hey, can you send a stormtrooper or two up to, to this concert? And one one did. He, he drove all the way from Rhode Island to Vermont and um, in, in a night and then back again. Uh, you know, this, it, it definitely was impressed everybody with the dedication. And um, Later that summer, he sold me my first suit, suit of armor, which is a, a, a regular Imperial Stormtrooper. Um, I put it together, and then over the next couple of years, I, you know, I worked at a summer camp. I wore it to that for like campfires and, and other sort of camp-wide events. Um, you know, Halloween things like that. Would I, I'd pull it out, and it wasn't really until I went to Star Wars Celebration Three in Indianapolis um, around the time Revenge of the Sith came out. So that would have been twenty two thousand five, I think. And um, that's when I met other members of the 501st. And I've got, you know, pictures of myself work, you know, in big groups of other Star Troopers. And it just blew my mind. So after college, I joined, you know, I, I was I was already a member, but I, I sort of got more formally ingrained with it because I had a car, disposable income and weekends off so I could drive all over New England, did tons of troops, met a lot of friends um, who are still very close friends of mine today. And um you know, along the way, started adding to other, you know, adding to my my collection of armor. So I went from a stormtrooper to a clone trooper, um, and then when the new films came out, I added on a, a short trooper from Rogue One, a first order heavy trooper from the new trilogy, and um, a rebel pilot. Um, what else do I have? Got another another. I upgraded my my stormtrooper along the way. I've got another clone trooper in a box that I need to get to fit me. Um, made my kid a couple of of suits of armor i've got one i'm working on now for him for halloween let's see if i make it um and then along the way you go to other other um uh, you know i went to other local conventions and you know i, I did a stargate a stargate costume and a, a costume of sam sam uh, bell from moon and a couple of others so that's basically my origin story in a nutshell 
Cool. Brandon, how about you? How did you get into this in the first place? And is it is it cosplay is just the whole concept, or do you use different terms for cosplay versus costume versus? Because you, I've seen your feed, and you do some extensive planning. <laughs> oh yeah, so cosplay literally means costume play. So I agree with Andrew; it's very much the activity. Um, but because the the it's, I always think of a cosplay as more than a costume because the outfit usually includes these very personal items to the person or the character that you don't generally get if you just pull a costume off the shelf. Um, usually they've taken it to the next level, like they've studied the character, they've watched the, the show or read the books and really know the history behind the character. So I think that's the, where costume becomes cosplay. And how um, long have you been doing this? Um, I want to say a little over 10 years. So I actually started cosplay almost accidentally. So I was a theater minor in school and did local theater just performing and really kind of relied on my costumes as part of creating a character. And um, once I realized that, oh, this isn't something that I have to be in this large production to do, I actually was using it um, in my library job to promote literacy. So for the month of October, it started, I was just going to try for a week and I made the week. So I tried for another week and then it ended up being the whole month of October. Um, matter of fact, I then I started doing it during band book week, which is the last week of September. And people were so engaged and excited about it. Like people would hunt me down in the shelves of the library being like, hey, I haven't got a chance to guess your costume today. Who are you? Can I get some hints? <laughs> um, and then I left public libraries and went to a healthcare library, an academic library. And I was like, oh, this is a very much more serious space. Um, I don't think I'm going to do cosplay here. And September rolled around. They were like, so you're doing the thing, right? I'm like, oh, no, I don't think so. I don't think it's appropriate. They're like, you told us about this months ago. You're doing the thing, right? <laughs> So um, now I have healthcare students coming up to the front desk and be like, oh, awesome. I haven't got a chance to guess your, your costume yet. Or, um, hey, um, can I get another guess? Hold on. Or they'll go get their friends. And so it's been interesting trying to figure out, um, what is it, around 20 days worth of costumes to show up that are also work appropriate. Um, actually, you caught me um, today. I'm, I'm doing T'Challa from Black Panther. Again, I like costumes that are fairly simple and comfortable and functional. Um, Especially if you can wear them every day in a different one. That's got to be. Exactly. How about that, Andrew? How how comfortable is it to be in that stormtrooper armor? Do you do? Is it something that you do all day long, or is it to to go do a event for a couple hours and stop? Usually, it's a couple hours. I used to be able to do it all day, but you know, as I've gotten older, it's like not. <laughs> it's not quite as user friendly and it, it depends on the type of armor that I'm wearing. Um, let's so my regular stormtrooper is it's just ABS plastic that I, I just, I throw on and, you know, if I'm, if I'm outdoors and it's, it's a decent temperature, I can wear that for as long as, as long as I can stand it. Um, my first order. So not here trooper, in South Florida. <laughs> I have no idea how people in uh, the Florida Garrison folks do it because um, I've I've heard of folks like people, especially people who do like Darth Vader, like getting heat stroke and collapsing, and with like uh, certain certainly not with like um, what is it uh, like my my first order heavy trooper because that's fifty pounds of fiberglass along oh. with a, a one piece bodysuit which which has these detailed thick details like they go over my elbows and my shoulders and my knees. They're basically like extra sleeves, um, you know, heavy gloves like that. That gets warm pretty fast, especially if I'm inside. Um, and like, if you're outside, it, it usually it's a little bit better. At least, at least up here in the the, the proper northern climates that we have. <laughs> um, but my my favorite troop that I did in that one, I, I've done with that one, which was actually fine, was the uh, Macy's Day Parade uh, last year. They uh, Lucasfilm hired a, a bunch of uh, troopers to act as performers for a parade uh, for the for the a parade float, and um, that was actually like the perfect weather. Um, I didn't overheat. I mean, I was sweating, but I didn't overheat. Uh, my my helmet didn't fog up, and um, the only the only real lasting um, damage I had is I had a, a piece of a 
like a, a piece of plastic sort of digging into my into my thigh for you know good uh, however long the, the walk was and i had a bit of a scar left from that um but like you know it really also it depends on costume costume like some some of the some of the other costumes um my rebel pilot is is a really comfortable one because i can sit and i can move around pretty easily um i have to fix a couple things with it um that sort of fell that have since fallen apart i have to replace a couple pieces but um you know that's that's fairly comfortable um although you know i was i was um I'm not sure I'd like that for really warm weather, but like my stormtrooper, like if, if I have like a sort of thin under armor on it and it's and it's outside and there's a little bit of a breeze, you know, I can do that all day. Um, I have no idea, Brandon, how you can do 28, 20, 20 costumes in a, in a month, like just one after the other. That's, that's intense. And that, so props to you for that. Well, I was going to say the same to you because you're talking about just the heat, but not just that, but in a costume where there's armor, you have mobility issues. If there's a, a large size mask, um, you have visibility issues. Like most people in the, the helmets don't have any peripheral vision, which is a big deal when you're you're walking mm. through like a con or some space and trying to avoid obstacles, especially when in a costume as popular as the ones that you're describing because people bum rush you they just run up to you so if you don't have a handler to say hey he can't see you or or like kind of help you navigate it can be a big really rough <laughs> I, i've got an advantage to that is that i was the only or one of the only troopers in vermont for a long time and um i got really used to being to doing solo troops so like yeah. you know for the just the geography of New England. Um, if I wanted to go to a trip with a lot of other people, I'd go down to Massachusetts, which is a three or four hour drive, uh, depending on where it is. And I've, and I've done that. I've, I, it'll go like early in the morning, drive down, do the trip, drive up, drive back. Um, here in Vermont, like if there's only one or two trippers and, you know, nobody wants to come up from Massachusetts to do like a little community fair or like a, a just a rant, one of the, any, any number of the random little events that I did over the years, like, you know, I'm the only one doing it. So I would get, I had to figure out how to get my costume on by myself. And then oh, wow. I, I've, you know, I, I've had the armor long enough that I've been able to sort of tailor it enough so that I can, I could comfortably run in my stormtrooper. Um, at celebration, I was late for a, um, a group picture, uh, the, the big 501st Legion picture. And I had yeah. to, I went to the wrong place. It was the other side of the convention hall. And I basically sprinted from one end to the other um, in, that, <laughs> in that armor um, wow. to get there on time. Um, so that's, I'm also kind of tall so that, you know, that I'm like the right height so that I can sit pretty comfortably in it too. Hmm. Um, the, the only one that's really uncomfortable, like the, the first order helmet's great. Cause it has like a, um, it's, it, it's wide enough. I can wear my glasses in it and, and all that. The only one that's really uncomfortable is my short trooper helmet because it's all resin and it's got this big sort of head face shield and it sort of, it, it sort of pushes down on my nose, um, to the point where it can get kind of painful I, I figured out some sort of workarounds for that which is to um basically put like a like a like a washcloth or like a paper towel and like fold it up and put it like right on my forehead and that will keep it from from doing that that's like the most um that that works pretty well but you know peripheral vision is i you know I, as i walk around you know you're looking sort of side to side um the only time that i really have issues is like when kids come up and they like come like i've had kids like run up and hug me around the legs and then then yes. i can't see them and it's sort of like, all right, I know someone's there, so I just, you know, hold still until they, uh, until they sort of the parents collect them or they sort of wander off. Um, exactly. But um, yeah, I mean, there's other, you know, some of the other ones are a lot more difficult that I've never done. Like the Tuscan Raider, you're basically looking through two tubes, um, yeah. and that's that's hard to see out of, and you really do need handlers for those. Uh, Darth Vader can be a, a, a problem as well. Um, but yeah, it, it, it all you know, it all varies. I think. Just yeah. Which, which costume you have? Do you have like face shields? So, like when I cosplay Spider Man, they actually mm -hmm. have face shields you can put in there that will keep the mask off your face. Otherwise, it kind of collapses. Mm -hmm. It can be a little bit hard to breathe in those fabric masks. And again, I try to go for the Spider Man with the larger eye holes so mm -hmm. that you can actually see. Um, yeah. No, we don't have anything like that just because it has to fit under the helmet. And like in, in some cases, I can't wear my glasses underneath, um, which means I'm, I, can't see very far yes. um i once looked into seeing if i could get like prescription lenses for it that's um and there's like they're, they're just, just big enough that it's not practical to do yeah um so like w which spider-man do you do like which any any favorite films so i'm mildly addicted to into the spider-verse i'm very excited for the mm. second one to come out so, so excited 
I have um, Miles, I have Spire Noir, um, and I do a pretty decent Peter B. Parker. Hey, he's then... the uh, Broken Hobo Spider-Man? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> he's amazing. I, that is the only Spider-Man that I'm able to do because, you know, I've, I've got a, a, a slight gut and I'm not in any sort of shape. Um, I, I was able to build one out of every just stuff I had in my closet. Yes, um, and I had to, I had to buy like an exercise Spider Man shirt, but like that that was a fun one to do just because because there's also like a whole bunch of other ones at the con when I was when I went and I did that one. Yeah. Um, Tell me about that my... part of that, Brian, Brandon. About mm -hmm. so it, one of the things we always talk about: what equipment did you start with versus what you your ideal piece of equipment that you would have now, and is it something that is as simple as I mean your Pinterest planning page is like just all this amazing stuff. Is it just like having that kind of tool or what is it for someone who has no idea, but they're like, wait, wait, I can just dress up as what? Any day of the week? What, what, do you, what did you start with to how you got here and how would somebody else interpret that? So I would always start with what's in your closet. Like pretty much all of the cosplays that I do, I, I do what are called closet cosplays. Like what I'm wearing is a closet cosplay. So Basically, I had a black shirt, I had black pants, black shoes. I was like, this will fit for Black Panther. And then because I saved money on um, using things I already have in my wardrobe, I can spend a little bit more on like a robe like this that is movie um, accurate. Or I can go out and get a necklace like this. So I added two pieces to my own closet, and all of a sudden I have this fairly recognizable cosplay. But also, it's a lot of it is knowing that you can interpret your character in any way that you see fit. Um, a lot of people feel like you have to be like a bodybuilder to play a superhero, or you have to be petite, um, like a lot of the, the female characters that we encounter. Um, but I kind of like turning that expectation on its head. Like one of my favorite cosplays to do is Harley Quinn. Because she's edgy, everyone expects her to be blonde and petite and sassy. And I show up with an authentic love for this character. And I'm wearing my red and blue or my red and black. And um, really, people are enthusiastic to see this black guy dressed up as, as this character who is traditionally both female and white. Um, so what, what I wish I'd known when I started was that you can do anything. Like, as long as you are, are interested and dedicated to it, and find an approximation that works for you. So when I started this particular year for my, my 20 costumes, I was like, you know what, this year... I, I need to interrupt on that one. Yeah. When did you start? Oh, like, um, At what point earlier in the year do you start your planning for, I'm going to wear these 20 days? So... What, or are you already planning for next year? It's a little bit of both. So uh, I could think of Miles Morales really easily when we were having the conversation because that's what I expected to be wearing today. I happened to watch Black Panther last night and I was like, oh, actually, I have all the pieces for that. You know what? I feel like this is going to be more comfortable, especially with what I have to do today. So a lot of times the morning of, the plan can change very dramatically. Um, Miles is a little bit more work because he's got a lot more layers. Like you were saying, we're down in Florida, so I don't want to dress too warmly. Um, but also, <laughs> he's wearing a spandex suit. Like, if I have to go to the bathroom in that thing, I have to almost <laughs> get naked just to do it. So it's not always ideal. <laughs> How about um, it, Andrew? What, 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 what are your ideals? You, you mentioned like ABS and other things like that. And here in Creation Station where we've got the printers and we've helped people print parts of costumes and things like that. The mm -hmm. printers are are you using? Did you? How did you build up to? It sounds complicated to have a full stormtrooper armor. Stormtroopers are actually pretty easy, um, and some of that might be just that I, I've built them over the years. But like um, you, there, there's there's some types of costumes that are really complicated. Like um, I, was, I was talking to somebody the other day, and like Din Djarin from The Mandalorian is, is is a really good example of this because it has so many different materials that go into it. If, if and this is if you were trying to be screen accurate, right, as the Five Hundred First strives to be. So for that, you need um, you know a helmet, all of the armor pieces, um, 
those can use you can either get those as you know AB, uh, you know uh, vacuum formed plastic fiberglass 3d printed or even metal um but then you have like the undersuit which is has to be stitched in a certain way and has this certain details on it has to be a certain color and depending on what episode he's in or what um you know what season he's in it changes it it changes almost every episode that's to slight in some slight list and slight variations yeah, that, that's that um, right there is, i'm like wow that is really yeah deep. i mean between then, brandon saying people, he's making people guess and now you're saying no i'm going to change my costume based on which episode of which season yeah um then there's leather stuff then there's boots then there's um the weapons there's the cape there you know jet pack and there's so there's all these variations that go into it. so can, that can get really really complicated and that adds up quite a bit you can spend thousands of dollars getting a, a perfect one um and then you have to get like the right paint you can't just use a, a regular spray paint to get the right color you um, people have been using something called aluma luster which is this graphite based uh material that you i, I don't I, I think it's a paint i think they've been airbrushing it on um, but you basically can, you can also, um, basically paint it gloss back black and put graphite on it. It'll get about the same texture, but it's, it's a really hard color to get because it, it, it's reflective, but dark and it, yeah, it's that, that's sort of a whole rabbit hole for complexity. Stormtroopers are easy. All you need is, um, Under Armour, um, and you need a, a suit, you know, uh, the armor kit, which, and all the pieces, you know, we usually make our stormtroopers the way that they did for the, the original films, which is basically you vacuum form a lot of plastic um, and you get, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. So like 29, no, uh, belt, um, 30, 30, let's say like 30, 35 pieces of plastic. You trim those, you put them together, you get glue, you put the snaps on or, or Velcro, um, make, you know, just strap it up. And then you're, you're pretty much good to go. You, you can, if you have the wherewithal, the, the time, the, the tools and the, the workspace, you can probably do it in a couple of days if you're really, you know, really cruising. Um, some people take a lot longer than that, but you know, like, that's a relatively easy one to put together. Um, but like with, with anything with the armor, it takes a lot of time, uh, you know, a lot of we like to say that you need a lot of um, re to put a lot of research into it. Uh, again, we, we're a screen act. We, we strive for screen accuracy as an entry requirement. Um, if you want to make your own stormtrooper out of paper mache or cardboard or foam or um, metal or whatever you can find, you know, more, more power to you. I mean, that there's, there, as, as Brandon said, there's, there's no limit to like what you can do as a cosplay. You, um, um, but like, you know, we, we we try to you know encourage people to like you know how how close you get to the films and like you know you can't usually I mean unless you have like a whole bunch of spare parts lying around and and some of us do after a little while um, you know you have to sort of plan ahead and to either print the parts or or to find a place to buy them or um, or, or fab them yourselves um, and you know that that varies from costume to costume. Um, some are even easier, like an Imperial crewman. You just need boots and a, a jumpsuit, patches and a hat, and some other some other greeblies. And you know, those are fairly easy to put together. Um, but I like to I like to sort of point to stormtroopers as like a they only require like one type of material to make them, um, and it, that sort of cuts down on the complexity. And I think that's one reason why they're they're still they're still fairly popular. You know, they're fairly easy to put together, and and um, you know they're and they're fun to wear. They're iconic. People like to wear them. Um, People, people like to go up and high five us and like, you know, you're my favorite character. Like, well, you know, we're not really the good guys, but <laughs> yeah. um, we, we, we like to say that we're, we're the, the ba bad guys doing good. So we, we like to do like a lot of, you know, charitable work and things like that in costume. So, you know, it makes it a little okay. bit easier to when you're dressing up as a space fascist. <laughs> I was going to say the 501 is actually very well recognized. I want to say nationally, they've got a pretty big division down here as well. Um, yeah, Flor the Florida guys are uh, and and girls and and, and folk Florida folks are are really great at you know what they do. I mean they're they're organized. There's a big contingent of them. I, I want to say they're probably one of the bigger garrisons in the in the country, um, and they they're pretty well organized. They have a whole bunch of squads, which are sort of subunits from a garrison. Which like a garrison. So we have the legion, and then there's the garrison, which is sort of a local a localish regional group that you belong to, and a squad is sort of a more hyper local group so like you need like 10 people for a squad so like if you're like 
way out in the boondocks like we are here in Vermont, you know, we formed a squad that is part of the New England Garrison um, just to help sort of coalesce that community and, and to help each other out. We've got about 30 members up here now. Yeah. I was going to say also a lot of what you've said, you've spoken like a true fabricator. And that's a big distinction within the community. I think as you you grow within the cosplay community, you learn different people make different things. Mm -hmm. And you can either find out how to make things through people or um, cosplay has grown to a point where there's a lot of websites where you can buy things at different levels of completion, depending on what you want to do, whether you're adding your own decals or you're doing your own paint or some of them are completed, but most people will add their own touch to it, particularly because yeah. Completed items can be so expensive. The cost is yeah. astronomical. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of time. And I think I think a lot of people sort of look at, you know, as they're coming into it, like, oh, I can buy this costume. And they don't really see the level of work that goes into it, right? Like, you know, you have to, like, if you're sewing stuff, like, you have to know how to use a sewing machine. It, it's like any, it's like any artwork, you know, that you, you put together, you, you, it's all hidden under the surface, all that, the, those years of of learning and perfection and trial and error. Um, let, me, let me follow up on that with you a little bit, Andrew, there. For both of you, what was your original, original creative outlet? I mean, uh, Brandon, you mentioned dance earlier and, and being in theater. And Andrew, did you do earlier creative stuff outside of cosplay that you now bring those tools in? And that kind of um, stuff or and did you learn i'm guessing as you've been talking here it sounds like you've learned a lot of new creative skills also to help out with what you're doing yeah i mean i i was i i was always interested interested in science fiction um and so i i was writing stories that i'd send off to asimov's when i was in high school and would get the form letter rejection back and you know so i was always interested in that i don't know if i've really taken that to cosplay um but like what I have learned from being a cosplayer is, and, and you know, some of my upbringing was 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 this. My my dad had a workshop in, in our house, and so you know, I learned how to use a lot of tools, like you know, how to you know saw board and, and you know, you know things like that. You know, um, uh, yeah, I was also part of. Uh, we don't really have a lot of it here in Vermont anymore, but like tech classes where we you know we learned how to do woodworking and metalworking. Um, but like cosplay really helped cement some of that and it, less of the some practical things like how to use glue, how to paint, how to, um, you know, you know, to, how to sort of look at something like look at a project and like, this is what I want it to look like and then sort of backtrack and figure out the project and the process that you need to go through to do it. So like, all right, so I want my bathroom to look like this. So I need to strip the wallpaper off. I need to get the paint, I need to do X, Y, and Z in order to start this project. And so I think that's more of where I've learned and that's what I've, I sort of hold up as a, a really good thing that cosplay can do for people is, especially because we don't, at least at least here in Vermont, I don't know where it is, how it is in other places around the country, like education budgets as they get slashed, the first things to go are arts programs, tech programs, you know, these really, you know, home ec, these really practical hands-on things and, um, this is a really good way to learn things on the fly. And so, and, and, you know, they're very practical hands on things. Like I can somewhat confidently fix a sink at my house or, or, I, you know, I had to replace our tub at one point and, you know, that's something that I was able to figure out how to do or like fix, fix things. Um, and so that it's a really, it's a very practical hobby in that sense. Um, if anything, just for getting the mindset, and yeah, you know, Brenda, I see you're nodding. So I'm guessing you've you've yeah. done the same exact thing that I've done. I'm kind of similar. I think I, uh, what I've learned is I'm more of a specialist. So mm -hmm. when it comes to a cosplay, I'm really good at looking at a character and breaking down what the different pieces are, how to create the silhouette, and what we might need to assemble. So as part of my community, I've learned to find the people who have the skills that I don't have. So like one of my friends has a 3D printer. So we really rely on him to print out like the little accessories like buttons or emblems, but also some of the bigger things too. He actually made me um, a staff for my Echo cosplay from Arcane. So he printed out this fairly large thing that we ended up spray painting and like assembling versus my other friend who sews and can make things again, more screen accurate, who will go out of her way to find the right materials to find out how to do a stitch or, or get her, her, um, her sewing machine out. So 
for me, it really became more about becoming part of a team and really specializing on what I was good at and kind of trying to compensate where I could, but finding those people who had the skills that I didn't. Yeah, that's the core. That's the core thing about cosplay. I think is it, it's it's the technical skills are part of it. The costuming and the the love of franchise is part of it. But it's really all about community. It, it's mm-hmm. finding your tribe and your the, your people who are like minded. Oh, yeah. um, but I, I wrote my book. Uh, this is sort of a late revelation. But like um, I, I was writing something about you know how you you wear a t shirt that sort of signals like what you're a fan of. Like you're, whether it's a band or a beer type or a franchise a and team. a baseball team and <laughs> you know this cosplay in some ways is is sort of just an extension of that you're trying to figure out like you know who who else is a super star wars fan or an arcane fan or a black panther yes. fan and you know or just you know hey there's another person who's who's a who likes science fiction fantasy and comic books and everything like that and um you know that i think is really that's what it's all about is trying to find people who are like you and who, or at least share this one common interest. Um, yes. And it, you know, it, it's, it's one of those, you know, it's one of those community things that I think we're really lacking in the U S right now. It's just like this, you know, common, I don't want to say common ground sort of things because everybody can be so divided. Uh, um, you know, cosplay can really transcend national borders and politics and gender and all these things. So I think that's where it's really, you know, um, you know, at its, you know, at its best is that you can form these sort of these communities mm-hmm. with people with this one, you, you know, you might not agree with each other on politics or, or baseball teams or whatever, but you can at least agree uh, like, you know, Hey, we like star Wars. And even then we can have disagreements, but uh, you know, like we could, we, at least we like this broad bucket of something. And then, you know, we can, you know, find that at least that, that little bit of common ground, if that makes sense. Well, no, I feel that in a big way. Cause I was thinking about too, from the outside, I feel like a lot of people think that, cosplay is very much a look at me type thing that people get Mm. dressed up and go in public spaces so people will be like wow and look at them but it's not like that it's like hey i have this amazing baseball card or i want to talk to people about this book or this movie that i really love and you you find your community in this way by by showing them hey i spent all this time and energy and resources in creating this look for for this character for this franchise that i really love um and a lot of times it amazes so many people that so many cosplayers are introverts, which mm. I think is very common <laughs> with performing in general, that they're like, wait, yeah. how can you stand up in front of all these people dressed in a certain way or doing a particular activity um, and be introverted? How, it doesn't compute for most people. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I go back to the hotel room and collapse and don't come out for three days. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> So, Um, Brandon, you brought up a really interesting point there, though. What's the difference in between being proud of dressing up and doing what doing what you're doing as part of a community and the people who put on the the Superman costume or whatever and are busking on the street corner or, you know, on for that kind of stuff? Where where does that because usually at this point I'm asking the question, so how do I turn this into a career or a profession? And I'm I'm kind of thinking that the next level up from what you two are doing is like being in professional <laughs> things, you yes. know, looking for Disney or being on stage. So what's, what's the other possibilities? I mean, is that busking idea real or is it? I think in today's day and age, most of the people who are in that in-between stage end up being streamers or they end up doing promotional work for the different franchises. Um, so they also try out a lot of different services because there's so there's this entire economy built on cosplay now because it's become so popular, whether it's people buying cosplays, um, showing up and doing appearances, um, being screen accurate versus um, people who do more things like um, cos- cosplays or even Disney bounding, which is a really popular one where you just really explain that Disney bounding. <laughs> so... Disney Bound is based on a woman who created a blog who she was very excited to be going to Disney and she started making outfits based on the color palettes of different characters on the days leading up to her trip. And that's important because Disney does not allow you to wear costumes at their parks. Um, They don't want you to be mistaken for a paid costume performer. 
Um, so this is the people's way of still showing their appreciation for whatever franchise they're interested in or whatever character. And then most of the people go around the park and find their characters or, or something that's emblematic of that character, a space or um, a building and, and take pictures there. Um, and so really there's an entire co economy that people have built on because they know that people will show up in in large numbers to purchase to 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 be seen um, to participate i imagine you could go to disney right now and you could you could get in and have you know do basically what with, with what you're wearing right now um as, as a sort of a, a quasi disney founding sort of thing exactly um i know that the star wars folks do a lot of that they, they will um kit bash their phone case and they'll make it look like a star wars um style uh like comlink or data pad and um you know they, they might wear sort of like a star wars look star wars type object or like costume but it's not you know you recognize that it is it is a costume but it's not a costume it's not like a, it's like their own creation um the other thing I, i'd point to is there a different word for that andrew you're my no, expert disney, on this is it is disney, it just disney bounding um, okay same, you know, or, same or thing, like, no matter no matter what the, whatever the the franchise slash universe is it's just disney bounding is is the Gen generic term yeah i don't i don't actually know like uh like hollywood studio is it hollywood studios that has the, like the harry potter world um or universal studios yeah yeah, I guess universal. Universal. yeah 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 i imagine people do the same thing um i don't know if they call it something different uh, that's a good question i want to say it's a generic um term but because yeah. disney owns so many franchises because they own marvel because they <laughs> own lucas films now they own the rest yeah. of the world yeah <laughs> exactly so it all f still falls under disney bounding um, mm. because I think at Universal, I think you can actually purchase, um, Harry Potter robes there. So yep. they, they, they definitely walk that line between how much costuming you can do at some of the other parks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious on that. Andrew. And the reason I, I, there's one woman that I follow on Instagram because she has, she's done this as she, as Brandon was saying earlier, she's, she's created these like two personas. One happens to be Taylor Swift where she's like mm -hmm. cosplaying Taylor Swift. And I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, so it's kind of interesting to see sometimes. And then when the new album drops, it's like, okay, whatever. Um, but that's what I'm kind of curious about. It, it's, it's where does this fall into it for you to experience cosplayers? where does that fit into the community overall as you were saying you know the versus screen accurate versus disney bound it seems to be like the next step up from just like dress up on the weekend and, and that's it i mean like when i go to gaming conventions i see lots and lots of people dress up and whatever they want to do as character or whatever i never thought of it as cosplay if you just showed up at the convention dressed as a wizard for the one night and then you leave but now you guys are making me think, well, maybe that actually is kind of doing cosplay instead of just dressing up for the night. Well, my question is always, again, is it based on a specific wizard? And if so, are you referencing them? Like, do they have some kind of catchphrase? Um, are you are you trying to associate with a particular franchise? Maybe you're seeking out other characters who are like you or um, even seeking out yourself in, this, in the case of Twilight. Taylor Swift, um, when I show up to a convention dressed up as Spider-Man, like I've seen Spider-Man take over a convention, like start making their own events, like finding each other in the hallways. Um, same for 501, like you start seeing stormtroopers and all of a sudden they start taking over. They're, they're just everywhere. <laughs> I think that I, I think yes to all the above. I think like cause, and th this was something I sort of tried to try to figure out with the book is is like what are the limits to this activity? And I, I what I came down to is basically you are expressing your fandom for something through your costuming, and there's a whole range to that, right? So you can you know say if you sort of have like Disney bounty as sort of like the minimalist way of of representing a character all the way up to. 100% screen accurate, like, you know, there's that whole spectrum there. Um, and, you know, cosplay, I think, it, and to some extent, is like the the fictional version. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a fan of something that's like a fictional story, you're interacting with the story to some extent. Um, and, you know, a close cousin to this is like reenacting. You know, you are, it, it's it's still, it's not really, I don't know if I'd call it cosplay, and I don't know if they would, if, if reenactors would call it cosplay, but like you are still interacting 
with a story, a bit non-fictional story, um, through the through costume and, and props and and whatnot. Um, you know, living history is an element to this, where you're actually trying. You have an educational mission. Uh, furries. You know, you're you're trying to sort of interact with this culture through the through the act of costuming. Um, you know, and you know, I think that you know, there's another cousin would be like you know the people who dress up for their you know for baseball teams or for Taylor, as Taylor Swift. Um, so I, I think that there's a, there's I, I don't really like really hard and fast definitions because there's so many yeah. you know uh, exceptions. But so like I think that what's what's best is like you know it's you're you're using costume to interact with 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 the, a story of some sort uh, again r whether it's real a uh, fictional story like a space opera or like a real one. Um, cause like, you know, civil war reenactors, like, you know, they're, they're tapping into like the story of the civil war, you know, and, you know, there might be more to dig into like history wise, like, uh, you know, facts and, and, um, you know, actual real, like lived stories, but there's, um, you know, that I, I, I met a bunch of, of, of reenactors at a world war two weekend in Pennsylvania, you know, they had exactly the same mindset as the, as the folks in the Bible first, like they were talking about how early they got up to go to the event. They were talking about how much money they're going to spend to get the next accurate piece of kit. And, you know, their love and appreciation of wanting to spread that with with the people around them. Um, so I, I sort of see them all as sort of, uh, you know, fairly closely linked as a, as a human activity. Yeah, you actually you got me this. thinking about those people who dress up in the paint at the football game and stand in the end zone. <laughs> and they're like, fans. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We're all fans. That, that's that, that's, what, it, that's what it was all is. Just no, extreme no, no, absolutely. I, I think that too, um, going in the other direction too, that cosplayers also engage with other people who love the same medium. So I always love when a cosplayer will do a cosplay of a fan fiction or, or, or an art <laughs> or fan art. Like it's amazing the things that people come up with because when it comes to things that some smaller artist has made that isn't necessarily um, a part of the larger franchise, finding ways to recreate that and kind of partner, you kind of like play off of each other um, and kind of support each other within the community. It's very cool to see. Yeah, I agree. So the other question, and here's the hard question. Usually we ask, you know, What's your biggest success or biggest failure in your field? I, I'm going with the idea. You guys both done really good stuff and had some things that really fell apart. Let's follow, though, on what you were saying, because you both kind of mentioned twisting or doing something. Uh, Brandon, you said, you know, do, doing like a gender bent idea of something like that. And you and we talked about, you know, playing the, the space fascists. Mm -hmm. um, what's the bad reaction stuff that you guys have had to experience because of what you're doing and or who you are in just in existence and existing and doing it yeah um i would say that when you're in cosplay just like with any art people are very open to giving you their opinions for better or for worse um i have been told that like harley quinn's a perfect example i've been told that i'm not allowed to play harley quinn because I am both male and black. And I was like, well, I'm also not a psychiatrist, nor am I going to try to kill you when you walk away. <laughs> like, I am not a homicidal person either. Um, or if I'm playing a superhero, not only am I black, but I also will not be flying or shooting fireballs. Or, um, and so you have that conversation a lot. And then on top of that, um, if you are wearing something, especially superheroes is a big one, you end up in a spandex suit and people are like, oh, well, you're dressed this way. So um, there's this huge movement called cosplay is not consent, where people, again, just grab you or touch you in ways that um, in any other form they would never even imagine. Um, but because you're trying to be screen accurate or, or because you chose a specific version of a character, um, people make a lot of assumptions about you and your character. And um, you end up having some tough conversations, both outside the community and within it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've, I have not experienced the racism because I am a white kid from Vermont and um, it, it just, that's just sort of my, my privileged position in here, but, you know, I've, I've been, I've done the, the South Boston 
um, St. Patrick's Day parade where there's lots of drunk people and, you know, been groped and, and, you know, because people don't see you as a person, they see you as a character. And I think that's sort of where that, where that comes from. Um, I'm trying to think of, of there, if there's, there's another sort of example. Um, and I completely it, I had a good one and just completely went Welcome out of my that. head. Actually, um, I was going to say, do you, I think you probably as a stormtrooper probably have to deal with people stealing your props, especially <laughs> with drunk people. <laughs> Not so much of people, bystanders, but anybody, any, any of our members who are Jawas, they oh. love to steal all of our crap. So I've had my blaster taken. I've had my thermal detonator taken by uh, a couple of, of my fellow friends who have are being mischievous Jawas. Um, oh, I don't know if that counts as a character. <laughs> yeah, it's completely in character. And like, it, it's what's fun is like when you have a kid, it, you know, it's a perfect kid costume for a kid, and you teach a kid, yeah, go steal that guy's stuff. <laughs> Um, oh, one thing I will one, one thing I will say, like uh, the other thing is that you know some people like with the with the final first we'll, we'll do a lot of events out in public, so it's outside of the convention scene where you know you you will it's completely normal to see all these characters running around. But like if you're at a store, so we did a you know most people get it like they like Toys R Us. We this this is this one moment that stands out in my mind, you know, and, and forever. Um, you know, we were doing it a, a, a late. Toys for Tots thing where we were encouraging people to to donate. We were, you know, three stormtroopers standing next to the box, and like this woman walks by. This, you know, very waspy woman just sort of walks right by us, and just like loud enough just for us to hear is like creepy, and then walks away. And we're like, what? <laughs> like, like what would make you think that it's like, you know, you know, it, I mean, it's just rude, is what it is. But it it was just it was just like it's just this this real. One moment, it's, it's, it's a good reminder that like not everybody knows what we're doing and understands what cosplay is, and, like what we're doing. And I, I think there's sort of this undercurrent of people thinking like, oh, these are just like these grown men who don't have a social life. When in reality, you know, most of us are gainfully employed and, you know, have, you know, um, you know families and lives and, and whatnot. And we're pretty happy with that. Um, so like that, me right to, that is you're answering the, the question before I could even ask it is what do you think the outside world thinks about this as a thing so keep going Andrew it, I mean it, it, with, with that question it's changing I mean there I think um, you know cosplay has become far more mainstream than it was 20 years ago um, when I started doing this like I definitely got a lot more strange look I mean people would still come up and like take pictures and think it was great it was is sort of a curiosity but nowadays um, you know we've had the Marvel Cinematic Universe come up. We've got Game of Thrones, The Big Bang Theory. Um, mm. You know, all these things sort of help popularize the idea that hey, science fiction is not like this this walled off thing. I thought you were like. going with cosplay about Big Bang Theory there, and I was like, really? I'm sure people have done it, but like, oh yeah, definitely. Some people make fun of the some, some people make fun of the show, but like that was a huge, huge hit with you know with, you know just as a as a sitcom, and you know cosplay is in a whole bunch of those episodes and it's it's a prominent front and center issue um i think that they, they has missed opportunities with like sheldon not you know just buying some off the shelf stuff as a yeah. costume and not uh, you know they could have had so many episodes of him like obsessively trying to find the right piece and there's so much comedic you know you know there's so much comedic potential there but like you know that 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 concept it introduced that concept to a lot of people um you know who might not have ever really they might have heard of Comic Con, but they might not have known what it was and what it means to people. And I think that show did a really good job in showing that um, to a to a, a widespread audience. Um, so I think that like those are like you know, it's it's a little bit more maybe publicly acceptable, and you know more people will understand what it is. And it, it doesn't hurt that there are conventions every single weekend around the year. Like it's not just San Diego Comic Con, New York Comic Con. You, your local library has little mini cons. You have, you know, every state, I think, has its own Comic-Con at this point. Um, so, like, that really helps. And, and again, like, you know, it's, it's Game of Thrones was a huge mainstream hit, you know, that got people talking about these chunky epic fantasy novels. And, you know, that's that was not the case 20 years ago. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, you know, coming around to a more mainstream thing. And, you know, people still sort of, like, they'll be walking down the street and they will just not look at you. They were looking everywhere but where you are because they don't want to acknowledge your existence. But... You know, that's not quite as common as it used to be, I think. Mm -hmm. 
I think too that all of the business has grown up around it because now you have photographers who specialize in cosplay, you have makeup artists, you have um, people who are making fan fictions who don't belong to the larger franchise who seek out cosplayers to fill these roles. Um, and so cosplay is very visible and again it's in mainstream media, it's in Big Bang Theory. Um, um, it's a little bit stranger things like there's all these little pieces where people are like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. These these adults are playing dress up, but um, to an end that is more focused on uh, showing a love for whatever they're interested in. Um, and the time and energy that goes into it, I think, is becoming a little bit more visible because, again, most people look at a costume and they don't think about the hours it took to get that piece there. Like if you're wearing wings or something or armor and you have to go from here to San Diego or some con um, like transport. Well, Brandon, you have wings. What do you need? You're just going to. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly because I, I, mean, I, I literally just got wings a couple weeks ago and. I think about that. I was like, okay, I want to go to a con. I've got these wings that are about four feet a piece. How do I get them to where I'm going? Because they're kind of an integral part of, of this costume. <laughs> like, what, what do I do? And then once I get there, um, like little things, like now I have wings. So these wings happen to cover my hand. So how do I feed myself at this convention? <laughs> how do I pick up things? How do I open doors? I have no fingers. Um, you need a really good assistant. <laughs> I always get that, especially um, Spider-Man. I'm like trying to just use my phone and you have no fingertips. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> yeah, same thing with Stormtroopers. Like I, I actually had found some gloves that will let me use it, but then I have to nice. like – I don't have anywhere to put my phone, so like yes. – and I have to have like – yeah, it's a whole thing. Um, it doesn't come I, I, will, I will sort of interject on like a completely random thing, but like one of the coolest things that I've found recently is – in and this is not something I'll ever cosplay as, but like – the amount of engineering that goes into wings is amazing. And like the, the strides that people have made um, I, on Instagram, I found like two or three examples were not too long ago. Somebody did um, it's Kira's underscore workshop on Instagram a while back. They did like these, they've got to be like 10, 15 feet wide. Um, uh, Captain, the, the new um, Captain America. Um, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the, uh, the Falcon. Um, Falcon. Yeah, uh, his his wings, yeah. um, with the Captain America garb, and it's like mm -hmm. they're not like like they're not like like cardboard or anything. Like these are like real engineered things that like that looks like they can take off. And it look and from the looks of it, he's got like, uh, or sorry, they uh, sh she's got like these really just they're so detailed. And it's just like amazing just at how cool it looks <laughs> it's like I, yeah. I really want to see that in person but they like these are things that will like fold up and they will yeah they can make them flat articulating and yeah i they i would be very surprised if they could not i'm, I'm sort of looking at the picture now and it, it the, these i I'm, I'm guessing it might be made out of eva foam or something but it's like like each feather is its own piece and it's just like the, the amount of detail on it like you know things that you can do with 3d printing um there's one that you know i, I just you can see it unfold and it like it moves on its own. It's got motors and lights. It's like just incredible. You so just reminded me. Um, you remind me why um, cosplayers generally do not wear cosplays on Halloween. Yes. Because <laughs> the amount of money and time and energy that goes into these things and you that's end up in off. these crowded spaces where like if you have articulating wings, that's thousands of dollars most of the time and people are like pulling on it spilling things on it bumping you um and it's interesting to see because most people think that oh halloween must be a cosplayer's favorite day and you'll never see a cosplayer in cosplay on a halloween ever <laughs> well i've i've done I, I, stormtroopers are good for that because i could just throw it yeah. on um uh, but yeah like you know i i, it, I completely get you I mean it's, it's like that's our day off it's like, you know, yeah. we do it we do it like 364 <laughs> days of the year so we can we can take that day off. Um, but or or you you go super low tech and yes. that's where you just you put together you throw something together that is you know purposely low 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 fidelity um mm -hmm. because you know it, it that that's a lot of fun um to do as well yeah um that's amazing you guys were both i i got a feeling we could keep on going for another hour here but we <laughs> we are coming up on our times um i do want to point out um Brandon, I want to put your thing. Tell everybody what your uh, actual site is 
that okay. you would like them to see as I'm putting it up here again for you. Absolutely. So uh, the name of my cosplay is Koala Tea Time Cosplay. Um, the Instagram is the letter K, the number two, the letter T Cosplay. Um, you can also find me on Instagram. Um, beyond that, I think you can also find my Pinterest I just found out under my email, <laughs> <laughs> which is Luke Deeper. Um, and this is literally how I construct my different ideas. I go out and see what different people look like, um, how they're assembling different things, um, different options for creating different versions of characters. Um, and then other things like um, temporary hair color has been a big one recently. Um, I did a Joker where I turned my hair green. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, for um, Echo, I went made my hair white. Um, so also finding out how people are, are finding effective ways to do cosplay that don't break, break the bank, but also kind of build community. Um, so, yeah. That was awesome. And Andrew, your book, I've got your page up here for your book, Cosplay of History. Yeah. That, that is, is out now, correct? Yes. Um, you, you can find an all story. It's from, uh, Simon, Simon Schuster's, if you go to Simon Schuster's web page, you can find it there and that'll, that'll send you to all the, the retailer links. They, there's Amazon, Barnes Noble, indie bookstores, et cetera. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically, that's, that, that's my website. Um, I also run a newsletter, um, called transfer orbit, which is, um, where I basically write all sorts of random things about science fiction, fantasy, you know, a bit about cosplay. Um, and so it's mostly about sort of like the future reading, that sort of thing. Um, and you awesome. can find me on Twitter as at Andrew Liptech, Instagram as Liptech AA. And uh, yeah, just search my name. You could probably track me down. Oh, you, you, get, you guys are both very findable now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So thank you again, both of you. Let me throw up our final slide here for the day. If you need any information or you have an idea for for one of our monthly shows, let us know, creationstation at Broward.org, and we'll get right in touch with them. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next month. Thanks for having us.